Is that better? Okay, thanks. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Um, the title of this talk is Hacking Headhunters. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started uh, by bringing up the outline. Uh, these are the topics I want to cover. Um, oh, I should start by saying that I brought Tootsie Rolls. Does anybody want Tootsie Rolls? <laughs> I'll start them over here, and you guys can pass them around. Okay, so here's what we're in for. Um, the session has three goals. Uh, the first goal is to get a better understanding about what recruiters do. Uh, basically, headhunting is just as simple as you think uh, in the general terms. But if you start to look at some of the details, um, you know, some of it's a little bit more interesting than you might think at first. Um, the second goal is to examine some of the processes and tools used by headhunters. And then the third goal is to apply that knowledge in a way that uh, you can begin to hack the process or at least use the information to your advantage when you're dealing with headhunters. Um, when I started thinking about different ways you could use uh, this information to your advantage, I realized that there's different ways that people interact with headhunters, and I came up with three different ways. Um, the first way is you might be a candidate who's going to be placed by a headhunter. You might be working with a recruiter to get a new job, um, and that's probably what would be most appropriate for today's audience. Um, and so if you're working with a recruiter to get a new job, you want to do everything you can to help them. And so tips that help the headhunter do his job are going to have a, a green smile face next to them in the presentation. Uh, you might be a manager or an employee who wants to keep their employees or coworkers from getting stolen by a headhunter. And in that case, you're going to want to try to thwart them. And tips along those lines will have the red frown next to them. And um, the third way you might interact with a headhunter is to um, Perhaps you have uh, an open position that you need to staff, and you want to consider hiring one uh, to help you staff that position. And so hiring a recruiter uh, tips have the blue guy with dollar signs in his eyes. Um, and at various points in your career, you may have uh, one or two or all three of these um, different ways of interacting with headhunters uh, happening. So be looking for these icons throughout the presentation. Um, we're going to start with some definitions. And we'll start with the most basic definition, uh, what is a headhunter or a recruiter? Um, very basically, uh, these are the guys who match up candidates uh, with open positions on behalf of their clients. Uh, a company will have an open position that they have trouble filling, and so they'll call up a headhunter and um, give them the task of filling that position. Um, most often, they pre prefer to be called recruiters or search professionals. Um, the term headhunter has been around for a long time, and it's considered informal, but not necessarily pejorative these days. Um, headhunters have a pretty thick skin, and I don't think I've ever heard of one being offended by being called that. Um, next definition is a search. Uh, the search is the name for the activity that the headhunter does when he's trying to place a candidate in a client's open position. Um, uh, a search is always for a specific, well-defined position within the client company. Um, and I put some examples here, uh, Vice President of IT for a bank, Oracle DBA. Um, it's always precisely defined, and um, uh, there's a specific open position with a specific job description that they're trying to, to fill. Uh, and we'll talk about the search process in a lot more detail later on. Uh, Next is a list of the players that are involved in the search process. And I've identified four. And we've actually already hinted at the top three, I think. Um, the client is the customer company who has an open position and who has hired the recruiter to, to fill that position. And the recruiting firm is the company that, that has the headhunters on staff who are going to perform uh, the search. Um, a candidate is a potential match for that open position. Um, and this is sort of the headhunter's raw material that he's going to use to, to satisfy the client's need. And um, the hiring manager is one guy we haven't talked about yet. He's the manager at the client company who has the open position. Um, 
and he's one of the most important players in the role because he's the one that um, is pretty much going to control the process from the client side. Um, every recruiting firm is uh, is unique, but uh, this this slide represents a common way that they're organized. Um, they're organized somewhat like law firms. At the very top, you have partners or owners who are in charge of running the business. Uh, their job is to bring in new contracts, uh, to make the executive decisions, um, and so forth. And there's a small number of them who um, sort of run the business side of things. And a step down from them are the consultants, and these are the senior, uh, the senior search executives who um, do the actual work of performing a search. Um, these guys uh, usually manage a portfolio of several concurrent searches, and they're in charge of interacting with the client um, and doing some of the interviews uh, before the candidates are presented to, um, presented to the client. And then a step below them is the associates, and um, associates are sort of the junior search executives, and they do a lot of the legwork. They spend a lot of time on the phone talking to candidates, they review resumes, and they do some of the interviews themselves. And at the very bottom are uh, what, what they call researchers. And if you have an image in your mind of a researcher as someone in a lab coat with a clipboard, that's not what these guys are at all. They're basically telemarketers who are just calling into companies trying to discover names and titles. Um, typically, each search will be staffed by one consultant and one or two associates and then a few researchers. And that's the team that's going to execute a search. Like I said, every search, search firm is different, but they fall into two categories. Uh, there's retained search firms and contingency search firms. And the basic difference between them is when they get paid. A retained search firm gets paid either up front or more typically in installments during the life of the search. And a contingency search firm only gets paid at the end of the search when they've successfully placed a candidate. And although this seems like a pretty small uh, distinction, it actually has a big impact in, in terms of everything else that happens at the, at the search firm. Uh, for example, the retained search firm is going to get paid no matter what. And um, getting the search done sooner doesn't get them their money faster. So uh, they often focus on searches at the executive level, such as CEOs, CTOs, um, vice presidents, directors, board members, um, because these searches tend to take a longer time to complete. Uh, companies are very picky about their senior executives, and, and that's why it takes a long time to, to make a placement at that level. Um, so they can afford to spend the extra time to, to make that happen. Um, their practice is also very oriented around the search. Uh, for every search that they're doing, they're going to collect um, uh, a number of candidates who are qualified and find the ones that fit the search parameters best and present those to the uh, client. This is in contrast to a contingency search firm. Uh, they only get paid at the end of the search, and therefore, um, you know, the longer a search takes, the longer it is before they get their next check. Um, therefore, they have to concentrate on searches that can be completed faster, and therefore they focus more on the individual contributor level. Um, and they also have different tactics. Um, every time they find a reasonable candidate, they're not going to send it to just one client. They're going to send that guy's resume over to, you know, every client they have uh, at the moment and hope for a match as soon as possible. Uh, I should mention at this point that I spent five years as a software developer for a retained uh, executive search firm, and so most of my slides are where, where it makes a difference um, are oriented toward that type of search firm. Uh, there are very few companies that do both kinds of searches. It's, it's rare for a company to cross the line. Um, they usually stick to either one or the other. Um, so here's our first set of, of tips for working with hunters. Um, if you're hiring a, a, a search firm, uh, you want to make sure you choose the type that's appropriate for the level of search that you're doing. If you're looking for a senior executive, you may want to consider a retained search firm. Otherwise, go with a contingency firm. And if a headhunter calls you and says they have an opportunity that might fit your background, uh, try to find out what kind of search firm uh, they work for, because that's going to tell you something about their motivation and the way that uh, things are going to play out. Okay. So that's the end of the definition section. Are there questions yet? Nobody? OK. Um, I'm going to move on to a few slides about the purpose uh, that recruiters serve. Um, recru there, there was a point in time um, in the business um, 
ecosystem when it was very difficult for companies to manage the hiring process themselves. Um, they didn't have a lot of resources for getting in touch with qualified candidates. Um, there was no Dice.com in the 70s, for example. Um, and uh, the tendency then was for employees to stick with a, a single company longer, in, as opposed to today where uh, changing jobs every few years is pretty typical. And that's part of the reason why recruiting firms came into existence, was to help uh, serve that need. They specialize in finding and dislodging qualified employees from companies and placing them with other companies. Um, today, um, the, the companies have more tools at their disposal in terms of finding, uh, finding talent themselves, uh, and that has put some pressure on, on the recruiting firms. Uh, even though uh, the recruiting firm is basically a middleman in between the people with the jobs and the people who need the jobs, um, and middlemen are sort of being replaced by the internet these days, uh, sometimes it's still useful to use a middleman. For one thing, uh, hiring new talent is an administrative task that uh, is not, doesn't directly contribute to a company's bottom line, and so it makes sense to outsource that task. Uh, furthermore, if you out outsource it to a recruiting firm who specializes in uh, your industry, for example, they're spending all their time, you know, hiring uh, in the hiring process, so they become experts at it. They may be able to execute the search quicker, which means you spend less time with that open position uh, uh, waiting to be filled. And if you've ever tried to hire especially a technical person, you know you get a lot of applicants who are just not qualified. And sometimes it's not apparent from the resume that they're not qualified. It's not until you're interviewing them that you find out that this is a bozo. And so if you can push off dealing with the bozos to some other company, that can actually be a big benefit. Um, and the last reason uh, it's useful to use a recruiter is because you can use them as a level of indirection to protect your company secrets. Um, for example, if you're a technical company and you're making a strategic switch from, let's say, Windows to Linux, uh, you might not want to put an ad in the paper with your company's name that says Linux developers wanted because that's going to tip off the competition uh, what you're doing. Uh, so it gives a way to provide some level of anonymity. Um, there's also such a thing as a confidential search in which the recruiters agree not to disclose the company who's uh, actually hiring. And that's a really useful way if you really don't want, want anyone in the public to know that you're hiring for a particular position. Okay, so we have a slide here that gives a high-level overview of the recruiting process. Uh, the first two steps are sort of the, the setup steps. Uh, first, the client company is going to select and, and hire a recruiting firm, and then they'll draw up a contract that specifies the position that's being sought, the level of compensation uh, for the new hire, and most importantly, which individuals from the client company and the recruiting firm are going to be involved in the search. Uh, steps three and four are where the work happens, and we have more detailed slides about those um, coming up. Basically, uh, the recruiter works on the search until it's finished. Uh, when a suitable candidate is found, uh, they'll be offered the job at the client company, and the candidate will start work. Uh, at that point, uh, we have the five, six, and seven, sort of the, the cleanup steps. Um, the client will pay the fee to the recruiter if it's a contingency firm. Uh, you'll remember that uh, a retained firm will be uh, paid up front or during, in, in installments during the search. And the fee is typically 25 to 33 percent of the candidate's base salary. Uh, for a long time, 33 percent was uh, standard and non-negotiable, but uh, uh, the dot-com crash of 2000 and the economic downturn one sort of made them uh, need to negotiate a little bit on price, and so 25 to 33 percent is the new uh, standard range. Um, the last two things are not offered by all search firms, but they're very common in the industry. Um, the hands-off agreement says that during the search and for a period usually of one year after the search, the recruiters won't try to recruit anyone out of, out of the client company to work somewhere else. Um, during the search, the recruiters have access to a lot of the company's and it would just be um, um, a difficult position for the client company if the recruiter was going to turn around and hire those people out of their company at the end of the search. Um, the hands-off agreement, agreement can actually be a very, um, a very useful clause because sometimes a large company uh, 
will actually lose so many people to a certain recruiting firm that they'll hire that firm to do a search just so that they can get the hands-off agreement in place and stop losing people out. Um, and then number seven is the search guarantee period. Usually if a, a candidate whose place doesn't work out within a, a set period of time, if he gets fired or, or leaves the job, the recruiters will redo the search for free. And that doesn't happen commonly. Um, it's quite rare. But when it happens, the recruiters really hate it because that's uh, work they have to do for free. And it's really hard because, you know, the easiest way to do that would be to take their number two choice from before and try to place them. But usually by, by that time, their number two choice has a different job somewhere else and they're not going to move. Uh, this whole process usually takes three to five months uh, for most positions, um, which sounds like a long time, but it's, it's actually pretty quick compared to uh, what the companies can normally do themselves. So if you're hiring a recruiter, um, there's a couple points of the process that you need to pay close attention to. First of all, read the contract carefully. A lot of searches get into trouble because the client assumes he doesn't have to worry about this problem anymore. Uh, he's paid the headhunting firm a bunch of money to worry about staffing this position, and uh, that's just not true. He needs to do some level of input throughout the, throughout the life of the search. Uh, the second thing is that almost everything in your contract is going to be negotiable. Uh, but only if you have something to give in return, and that's typically in the form of future business. Uh, for example, you can get a better price if you're going to do three searches in the next two years than you can if you're just going there for one search. Okay, now I sort of skipped over the do the work part of the, of the process before, and that's because we have details uh, on this slide. Uh, the first thing that happens uh, when a uh, search starts off is that the headhunter will try to identify the title practice area and industry that this open position belongs to. Those are sort of the three dimensions of search space is title, practice area, and industry. And an example of that is vice president of IT for a banking company. Vice president is the title, and then practice area is information technology, and industry is banking. Um, and then the second thing that happens is the recruiter is going to build a list of large companies that have that title uh, on their staff. Um, usually it's limited to large companies because small companies fly under the radar of recruiters. It's harder for them to get names from small companies. And also there's at least a, uh, a perception that uh, the best talent works at big companies. So if you're working at a small company, you're probably flying under the radar of a lot of recruiters. Um, this list of companies is then turned over to the research department, which I told you before was basically a bunch of telemarketers. And they're going to try to find the names and phone numbers of the people that have this title at all those companies. And the way they do that is the basis of a digression I'm going to take away from the recruiting process. And we're going to talk about some research techniques. Um, the very first thing they do is look through their internal database. They've probably been um, you know, at this uh, um, for a number of years. And so they've contacted hundreds or thousands or, or tens of thousands of people in the past. Uh, if they're looking for a vice president of IT for a banking company, they're going to just do a query for vice presidents of IT with uh, companies that happen to be banks. And they're going to get a list of people that they've talked to in the past. Um, after they have the list of people from their internal database, they're going to go out on the internet and look at the business networking sites. And LinkedIn is the number one site that they look at from, from what I've heard. Zigs and Rise are ones that I haven't heard of before, but apparently those are also out there. And Zoom Info isn't really a networking site. It's, um, it's an online service that mines uh, journals and uh, uh, news stories for uh, information about people at companies. Like if you're quoted in the paper as an expert on something, you'll show up in Zoom Info and your quotes will be tied there. It'll figure out your title and stuff from that. Um, so the smile face down there says, if you want to be found by a headhunter, you need to be on LinkedIn. That's the easiest way to uh, get, a, get their attention. After uh, they've looked through a bunch of databases to build a list of names, um, they have to start calling those companies and try to find out the names and phone numbers of people with the desired titles. And the way to find uh, the name of a person at a company that has a particular title is to just call the switchboard and ask. But if you say you're from a headhunting company, you're not going to get far, so you have to be a little slicker than that. You have to say something like what we have in this first bullet point. Um, they call up and say, hi, I'm Mike Lansing, and I'm trying to forward some information to your vice president of IT. Could I get his correct name and phone number? And um, it's really important that uh, they say this 
all in one breath as fast as they can and as dazzlingly as they can because they don't want to give the person on the other end any time to think because if they have time to think, they might think, this sounds like a headhunter, I'm not going to give them any names. Um, so you definitely have to be slick. Mike Lansing is a made-up name and it has to be a simple name uh, because if you have a complicated name, that's going to cause the listener to think for a second and we already said that thinking on their part is bad. All, all they want is for the person at the switchboard to either give the name and phone number or transfer them to that person. Um, forward some information is sort of the most general and innocuous way that you can um, try to get somebody's name and phone number. And it's not a lot it's true you want to forward some information to them. It's a job offer. Uh, happens to be a job offer. Um, but you don't say that in the, to the receptionist. VP of IT is the, um, the title and practice area of the search that we're doing. And I would say name and phone number is minimum information that they need to get. Um, email is great. Physical mail address is also good. Uh, this technique is called rusing, uh, which is a polite name for a polite way of saying lying. Um, but they use it every day to, to get names and phone numbers. Um, if that doesn't work the first time, the, the next thing they'll try is calling back at a different time, trying to get a different switchboard operator, or maybe calling at lunchtime or after hours, trying to get uh, you know the temp or the the weekend guy who who isn't quite as uh, familiar with uh, the technique. Um, but if you want to thwart a headhunter, just make sure everyone in your office knows about this and can recognize it and either hangs up a person or transfers them to the HR department uh, uh, because the HR department will be able to find out a little better if this is a headhunter or if they actually do need that information. Um, okay. That's the end of the digression about research. We're going to go back to the recruiting process. Um, we already talked about the first three points. The next thing that happens after the research builds a list of names and titles is that uh, the candidates go through the funnel. Uh, and I don't think funnel is a standard industry name. I think I made it up. So don't expect to hear that anywhere else. Um, it's basically a multi-step process that narrows down the large field of candidates down to a single, a single uh, person who actually gets the job. Um, and, and I should mention that not every recruiting firm's process is as structured as this. There's, uh, this is sort of an extreme example of how structured they can get. So at the top you have maybe 100 or 200 names that came from the research department. And these really aren't, um, we don't know the quality of these names. We don't know if this person even exists. We don't know if they've changed positions and maybe the title's not right anymore. Um, so each one of those people gets, there's probably one or two hundred of them, each one of them gets contacted in some way, either by phone or uh, letter in the mail or by email. And uh, the goal of this is just to judge, is the current information that we have on them accurate? And are they even interested in this position? And when all the answers come back from that, you're probably narrowed down the field by about half. And we call those people contacted. Uh, and I should also mention that I've made up the names for these statuses too. So um, these might not necessarily map to what you run into in real life. Um, once they're contacted, uh, typically what will happen is the associate will get involved. You remember from the earlier slide that the associate is sort of the low level legwork guy who, who does a lot of this type of stuff. He's going to contact every single one of these people uh, whose, whose names and titles we've verified and probably by phone and find out, you know, just from a five minute conversation, are they marginally qualified for the position we're looking for? And if they are, he'll ask them to send a resume. And that reduces the field again by about half. Um, at that point, the consultant gets involved. Remember from the earlier slide, the consultant is sort of the higher level recruiter. And um, they'll do a phone interview. Uh, They'll look at the guy's resumes and do a phone interview of some of them. And if they survive that process, they're called qualified. And then they'll bring in the top five to ten for an actual face-to-face um, -face interview or sometimes a video conference. And uh, of the five to ten that they interview, they'll either get rejected or um, the top three to five. Hopefully, there'll be three to five qualified. And the top three to five will be presented to the client. And the client will do an interview. And um, from that set of candidates, the client will usually choose one who is the guy who comes out the bottom of the funnel and he's really happy because he got a new job. Yeah. 
Um, and so this process has a number of steps that were listed linearly, but linearly, but at any point you might have to go backwards in the process because let's say at some point in the funnel you narrow down the field to zero or to a number that's too useful. Um, you may have to go backwards through the process and generate more names. So it's, it, it can be iterative. Okay, so that's the overview of the recruiting process. Um, and I say I'm right on time, so uh, are there any questions at this point in the presentation? Or, uh, uh, no? Oh. Okay. Another chance later. Um, okay, so at this point in the outline, um, we're getting into the frequently encountered issues, and this is probably the reason you came here in the first place was to talk about um, stuff like this. All of that was uh, sort of background. Um, when a recruiter is involved in the hiring process, uh, you have an issue where um, perhaps the client company is still hiring for that position themselves, plus they have uh, applicants coming in through a recruiter. And maybe the company is working with multiple recruiters. They may have five recruiting companies working on the same position. And um, this can lead to the problem of double submissions. Um, and it's, it's very risky because if your resume gets to the client company through two different channels, you're going to cause confusion or even contention because the client company is only going to pay one, one recruiter and it's going to be the one who got the resume to them first. And so recruiters don't like it when you put them in this position. So read the job descriptions carefully. If it sounds the, the same as one that you've applied to recently, it probably is the same and um, you know, consider either not applying or at the very least mention it to the recruiter that this sounds a lot like, um, a, a, lot like a job that you've applied to recently uh, because that way at least it won't be a surprise to him. Um, the next issue involved with uh, involving a headhunter in the process is that they can uh, actually add a certain level of confusion. Um, headhunters don't uh, because they don't work for the company that they're uh, hiring for, they probably don't understand that company's business. And this is especially true in the high-tech industry because it's a pretty complicated industry to an outsider. Um, so they may not fully understand the job description. Uh, furthermore, their timeline may not be the same as the client's, especially for a contingency firm. They want to get the search as quick as possible. So when they're talking to you on the phone, they're going to say, send me your resume this afternoon. I need to get it to the client. And then maybe the client's on vacation or he has other priorities. Um, and you don't hear from them for two weeks or something like that. Um, and that, that, that's very confusing to the candidate. And so the takeaway there is to just be, you know, a little bit patient and understand that, you know, you're going through an extra layer. It's going to take a little extra time. And then the, the worst problem is that the recruiter is fundamentally a And um, they may have oversold the position to you. They may have talked it up a little bit beyond where it actually is or they may have oversold your qualifications to the client. So um, there's an opportunity there for um, a disconnect. And the best way to work around this is uh, when you talk to the client company, uh, find out who the hiring manager is and um, you know, sit down and talk with that guy and you know, forget everything you've heard from the headhunter. Treat everything that the recruiter has said as being potentially inaccurate and get the story straight from the, the uh, hiring manager. Okay. Another issue that is sort of tied back to the previous one is that IT in particular is, is poorly understood by recruiters. And it's also poorly understood by the people who are on the phone at the companies the recruiters are trying to recruit out of. So uh, let's say during the research process, a recruiter calls a company and says, let me talk to your uh, SAP guy who does accounts receivable. And to the receptionist, they don't know who that is. To them, it just sounds like uh, somebody in the computer department. So they're going to get transferred to the wrong person. They're going to get wrong names. And it's going um, to follow up their recruiting process. And so what ends up happening is that it de degenerates into a keyword man. The, Recruiter gets a list of qualifications from the client company and they look for resumes that have those keywords on them. And that's not a very sophisticated way to conduct a search. Um, 
Therefore, when you're sending a resume to a recruiter, um, there's some resume tips that you might want to um, keep in mind. First of all, they get hundreds of resumes a day. So they probably have instructions for submitting your resume on their website, and you should follow those as closely as you can. Um, usually it specifies the document format that they're willing to accept. And um, you know, if they say they want Word documents, uh, don't send a PDF, because that's just going to confuse them. Um, just follow their instructions as closely as you can. Uh, if you're sending them a resume in response to a posting on their website, or especially if you're just sending a resume that says, here's my resume, please keep me in mind for any searches you might open that look, look qualified, um, you're definitely not going to get anywhere doing that. Uh, by contrast, if a recruiter uh, talks to you on the phone and specifically asks you for a resume, um, you know, that's a good sign. That means that they're going to get it and they're going to read it. So uh, that's the difference between a solicited and an unsolicited resume. Um, because they talk, if they talk to you on the phone and ask you to send a resume, they're going to remember you by name. So make sure that your contact information is very easy to find on your resume. And um, you know, don't make the blunder of having outdated or inaccurate contact information on there. Uh, and finally, load up your resume with keywords. Like I said in the previous slide, uh, they may not understand what they're looking for. They're just doing a text match. So if they're looking for someone with Linux skills and you put Ubuntu on your resume, that's not going to result in a positive match. So go ahead and put everything, throw everything you can on there. Um, you may want to keep a sane version of your resume for when you're working directly with a company, uh, but the recruiter version should have as many uh, buzzwords on it as you can. Okay. So, there's a few final pieces of advice. Um, every time you talk to a recruiter on the phone or in person or anything like that, they're going to keep a record of the date and time and some notes about what they talked about. So you should do that too. Uh, this is really useful uh, if you ever need to reconstruct a conversation or remember, you know, at what point in time you talked to a certain person about a certain thing. Um, and it can be very simple. It can just be in a text file or, or however you want to keep track of it. Um, but definitely keep track of it. Um, for example, if the recruiter tries to um, tell you at the beginning of the search tr to get your interest that the uh, salary range is you know, pretty high, uh, you'll want to write that down because later on if you get the job offer and it's for less than what he told you, uh, you'll have a record of what he told you and when. And it'll still be your word against his, but at least you won't be relying on your memory to say, I think he said it was going to be something like this. Um, you should always ask who the client is. Um, usually, uh, when a recruiter calls you, he'll uh, tell you about the, the title of the position and the type of work and maybe the industry, but won't, won't start off with telling you what company it is. Um, but knowing the company is very helpful. Uh, it helps you search them on the internet. Uh, it helps you know if you even want to work there. Some people don't want to ever work for a bank, for example, or they don't want to work for the government. So, you know, finding that out up front was going to save some time. Now, some recruiters don't like to tell you who the client is because they're afraid that you'll submit your resume directly to the company and go around them, and then they won't get their uh, commission. Uh, but uh, this shouldn't be a, a problem uh, if you're qualified, because the, the only problem is if the recruiter doesn't think you're qualified, he won't send your resume client, and so he doesn't want you to send it to the client on the off chance that the client might think you're qualified and then hire you, because then he's missed an opportunity. So if you're reasonably qualified for the job, they'll usually tell you uh, what, the, what the company is, with the exception of confidential searches, which I mentioned before, they're not allowed to tell you until such time as you're interviewing with that company directly. Um, and be willing to relocate. There's a trend right now against relocation because a lot of people have family issues, either they're caring for you know, elderly parents or they have a family situation where if they leave, you know, their kids are going to end up staying here. So relocation is not as common as it once was, or their spouse has a career or something like that. So it helps you if you're willing to relocate. Um, you know, there's not much you can do about that if you're not willing to relocate, but that's just a uh, bullet point there. Um, the next one is something I actually uh, mentioned on the previous slide, is to get the straight story from the hiring manager at the client company. Don't put too much faith in what you hear from the recruiter because they may not have understand it, they may have oversold it, or they may just have their story wrong. If possible, you should also talk to the other people in the group that you'll be working with, not just the manager, because 
um, that helps you get a, a broader perspective on um, what the position is like. And um, the last bullet point on there is that candidates are the raw material for recruiters. Uh, they're paid by the client, and they're looking out for your interests. Nobody's looking out for your interests except for you, which goes back to the first bullet point. You should keep records of everything that, that happens when you're dealing with a recruiter, or really when you're dealing with uh, any hiring process. It doesn't have to be through a recruiter. Okay. I guess I made up some time in that last part because I finished ahead of uh, schedule. Um, final chance to ask any questions. Here's what our goals were when we started the... Uh, the presentation. Uh, if you don't think we covered all those, it's your chance to ask. Or uh, if you have any other questions at all, uh, now's a great time to ask them. Um, well, unfortunately, the answer is it depends. Um, the best case would be that he would incorporate that, that information into um, you know, his knowledge bank or whatever. Um, I would say that you didn't burn a bridge. Um, if they were sending you an unsolicited questionnaire, um, you know, they didn't have high expectations for forming a lasting relationship anyway. Um, but I also wouldn't say that you necessarily uh, started a relationship on a good foot. Uh, you know, they don't really care. They're focused on the search that they're working on today, and they're not going to remember favors that you did for them in the future. Uh, I actually had a slide about this that I took out because I thought it was going to run long. Um, the, in recruiting, especially in uh, re retained rec recruiting, um, they're focused very specifically on today's search and who can help them today. And um, it's very rare that uh, someone will impress them so much that they'll go back to that person in the future. So, although I think you did the right thing, I don't. I don't think it's necessarily going to pay off for you. Um, I don't know. Have you sent them a resume? I have a resume of the Okay. Um, I don't actually know. I think that uh, they could be a contingency company that has a uh, you know, number of searches, and then every time one uh, runs into a sticky spot, they might be just you know calling everyone that's in their database of, of recent contacts. Um, or they might not be a recruiting company at all. They might be, um, you know, uh, some sort of other type of uh, employment service, uh, because the the weird thing is that they call themselves a talent agency. I, I've um, when they're talking to candidates, the, it seems like headhunters are really upfront about saying they're a recruiter and they're working on a particular search. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Talent. Sure. Sure. Talent company sounds like it might be a marketing term for 
recruiting company, and they might be trying to build a database. Maybe they're new, and they don't have a database of contacts from previous years. Um, uh, that's just speculation. Um, there's a spectrum of business services that, that are offered by consulting companies, and one, um, one thing that they offer is, is uh, recruiting services. Um, a related service would be like a temporary agency. Um, some, some business consultants offer uh, uh, you know, temp services even at the executive level. You can get a temporary CEO, for example. Um, some services are uh, you know, consulting services. You know, they have, let's say they have Java programmers and they'll hire them out at an hourly rate, um, but then they'll have sort of a try before you buy uh, package where they'll hire a, con a programmer, let's say, for a three-month contract, and then if the company likes them, at the end of the contract, they can pay a bunch of money and hire that guy. Um, so those are two other variations on uh, the recruiting spectrum. Uh, this talk focused strictly on the recruiting side of things, but you know there are other uh, business consulting services that, that are near uh, recruiting and placement that, that are akin to it. Yes? recruiter to, um, to make sure you stay there for six months or 12 months. Is there, is, is there pay dependent upon how, how long you stay? Um, usually not. Usually they want to get you in as quickly as possible to accelerate you know, either how soon they get paid or how many searches they can do in a given unit of time. And then if they have that, uh, that uh, performance guarantee where they say, we guarantee this guy will stick around for a year you know, they obviously want you to stay at least that long. Um, beyond that, it gets into sort of the, the softer side of things. They, they obviously have a, a vested interest in having happy customers. So if you stay around longer rather than leaving on, you know, after 13 months, um, they'll have a happier customer. So um, th there's no uh, financial uh, incentive to, to place long-lasting employees. So they don't, they don't care about the so-called onboarding process. They don't care, I mean, other than some minimum amount of time, they don't care whether you stay or go. In fact, they're probably happier if you're looking again. At sure, because, you know, they've already placed you once. They probably feel they can place you again. Um, yeah, like I said, the only issue is that that company may not use the recruiting firm again if they tend to place people who are a flight risk. Okay. Any other questions? Anybody looking for <laughs> Actually, if anyone is looking for a job, get in touch with me because my company has a few open positions for Java programmers and people who are good at um, installing and configuring uh, complicated systems. So catch me in the hall or whatever. Yes? How does a firm here in Cleveland cope with the overall drain from here to the coasts? I missed the first part of the question. How does a firm, a search oh. firm, a recruiting firm here in Cleveland, or you name it, Northeast Ohio, center of the country, <laughs> yes. cope with the drain to the coasts? It's an interesting question because it's one that I've been grappling with myself um, because a number of people that I've worked with in the past um, have done exactly that. They've left for California or Boston or whatever. Um, and uh, it's, it's really a serious challenge um, because... Uh, First of all, the weather here is crappy. Uh, and secondly, the economy is not much better than the weather. Um, and uh, you know, it's been, it's been a rough uh, past five or 10 years in Cleveland, or in, actually in the Midwest in general, uh, with a few exceptions like Chicago and some of the bigger cities. Um, and so that's, uh, it's a serious issue, not just for recruiters, but for companies in general, just finding people who are willing to uh, you know, work in Cleveland rather than uh, go to California. Um, unfortunately, one way they're coping with it is opening um, uh, branch offices in uh, cities that are more attractive. Uh, there's a local company that moved their IT uh, from Cleveland to Colorado Springs because they thought they could find more people willing to relocate to Colorado Springs than to Cleveland. So that's probably not the answer you want to hear. They're coping with it by uh, exacerbating it. <laughs> um, but that's just uh, you know one other thing that uh, you know, every position uh, has good features about it and bad features about it, and so that's the recruiter's challenge is to you know make the, the
the good uh, features appear to outweigh the bad features. And so if working in Cleveland is perceived as a bad feature, then they just have a little bit harder job to, um, to, to sell that position. Yes? Yeah, one thing, uh, I do a lot of traveling. And um, one thing that's very obvious about the benefits of Cleveland is the yes. costs. Lost 150,000 in Rocky River. You're looking at 900,000 in Silicon Valley for a 30-year-old house that needs yeah. a lot of work. So, you know, yeah, the, most uh, Java programmers can't afford a $900,000 home. The traffic and the and the uh, uh, cost of living are huge benefits. Um, we were uh, working with a company in Phoenix and. We were driving around in, um, you know, like up Lander Road, where some of the nicer houses are. Um, and they were asking, well, how much do you think these houses cost? And, uh, you know, we said, oh, well, you know, maybe you could get some of them for $300,000. And they were shocked because a house that size would be 10 times as much in Phoenix, which is an extreme example. Phoenix is sort of at the other end of the, the boom or bust spectrum from Cleveland. But, um, yeah, but Chicago's pretty bad, too. Yes. Well, sure. At least twice as much as Cleveland. Yeah. I'm moving to Cleveland. <laughs> <laughs> I think there actually are quite a few people that are headed back to Cleveland. In the condos, the, the people are definitely selling that stuff. They're, they're promoting Cleveland as a place where people who travel, people who can uh, do, you know, work at home, uh, are, are able to come. The, the real estate guys got to know what they're doing because they're putting up condos left and right all over the place. Yeah, if you can so, work for a company in California and get the Los Angeles salary commute from Cleveland? Right, exactly. You'll yeah. be in good shape. Cleveland Plus. Yeah, did you hear this morning we're rebranded? We have a plus now. That's I mean, that's what I do. I, I have hardly any clients in this area, but mm -hmm. I have clients everywhere else, and it's a great place to travel from. Small airport. It's great. Yeah, and it's a continental hub, so uh, you got direct flights to a lot of cities. Okay, any, anybody else? I guess we're out of time. Okay, these are the references. If you don't have time to write them all down, just write down the first one. It's this, uh, this slideshow, and you can download it and get to this page. Thanks a lot.